Today we're going to be talking about Joseph Pilates and his work right here at the pillow. And I do want to make mention that today is alumni day, so welcome to all of the alumni who are right here. Uh, I also want to introduce someone who many of you know, Norton Owen, the Director of Preservation right here at the Jacobs Pillow Dance Festival. Welcome. Thank you, fellas. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I wanted to say just a word first about why um, are we looking at Pilates at the Pillow this summer in general. Um, it is uh, very coincidentally, uh, this being 2010, uh, and he was born in 1880, the 130th anniversary of his birth, but uh, that was not uh, the, 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 the presiding reason that we decided to do something. It was really just that it was high time. Um, we find that with so much interest in Pilates these days that uh, it's little known, first of all, that there was in fact a Mr. Pilates. Uh, we find this all the time when we show photographs or films of Pilates himself and people express great amazement that, oh, look, there's somebody who named himself after this, um, <laughs> this exercise system, and in fact, it worked the other way around. So we thought we could do something about uh, raising the awareness of that and also calling attention to the years in which uh, Pilates was a valued member of the faculty here at Jacob's Pillow, uh, between 1942 and 1952. And uh, so that's what we'll be looking at today in various ways. One of the things that we're going to be sharing with you today are some letters, some memories that people have sent in to us from all over the country, in fact. Uh, and we're going to be doing this in an informal fashion. I'm going to be starting off with a letter that we have received from Sarah Genter. She's Professor Emerita in Dance at Barnard College at Columbia University, also contributing critic to Ballet Review. And this is one of her memories of Joseph Pilates. My first impression of Joe was vivid. Here was this powerful, older-looking man with a full head of hair, wearing nothing more than athletic trunks that, mo that allowed for most of his well-developed musculature to be clearly in view. He set a great example for achieving bodily perfection. As a teacher, he was passionate in his quest for everyone to engage in his fitness regime. One became aware very quickly of the importance of the core exercises that involved deep contractions in the abdominals and lower back muscles. There was no nonsense in his studio. Joe could keep his class alert with his commanding voice that could be gruff or gentle depending on how well we performed his instructions. If he was not satisfied, he would make a fist and direct it at a person's gut as a reminder to work harder. It took many days for me to be relieved of the enormous abdominal pain, Charlie horses, from Joe's classes, and I was not alone in my agony. I am quite sure I had never before contracted my core muscles as in Joe's classes that summer. Norton, you have a letter too. <laughs> um, this is, in fact, a little bit from, um, Ted Chauhan wrote his autobiography, many of you may know it, 1001 Night Stands, uh, but it was a, a, a vastly uh, larger manuscript that he created from out of which this smaller book was extracted. And we have a copy of his full manuscript here, which has so many other juicy tidbits, including this page uh, where he talks about uh, Joseph Pilates. Now, I hasten to stress that this is from the unedited manuscript, and he actually gets rather personal here at one point, but that's kind of interesting, I think, uh, telling about why he decided not to continue to have Pilates here at one particular time. This is Ted Sean speaking. Facing a winter of physical inactivity in 1940, I decided I would look up and try out a course of exercises at the studio of Joseph Pilates. Ruth St. Dennis had discovered this man and raved about him, and I could see with my own eyes how he had helped her. She had suffered for years with bad knees and could not kneel or get up without excruciating pain. The result of this and a general discouragement had kept her from practicing as she should, and she had added weight all over, and her ankles had gotten big. 
Then a year or two later, after working faithfully for many months with Pilates, she was slim as in the years when I first knew her, her ankles like a young girl's, and she had no more pain or trouble with her knees. I feel like I'm doing an infomercial here. <laughs> um, she called him a sculptor of the body and said he was no ordinary gymnastics instructor, but an inspired genius. And so I found him. I dimly recognized the old Van Dyke studio building when I first went to him, but only after many days did it dawn on me that it was in this building I had taught my first lessons in New York, spring of 1914. Joe and his partner Clara, intensely German in manner and dialect, were martinets, but he was truly a genius, and his system of exercises was all that Ruth had described. I went daily all that winter and the following year whenever I was in New York and lost weight, trimmed down waistline, got suppleness throughout my torso, and was altogether made over. The following summer, Joe came up to Jacob's Pillow. I had tried to sell him to Dolan, to Anton Dolan, who was running the pillow in 1941, and Joe did conduct a few classes in 1941, but Dolan was not really interested in his work and they did not get along well. The summer of the first big festival after the theater was built, 1942, and the summer after that, 1943, I had Joseph Pilates on my regular faculty, and he did the stretching and limbering class each morning. Everyone liked his work, and he gave private lessons and corrective treatments. Now we get into the little bit of the behind the scenes part. But the German in him and his age, 63, his last summer at Jacob's Pillow, were too much for me. He wanted to run everything. He maintained that all this dance business was nonsense, and the whole of Jacob's Pillow should be turned over to him to run as a health farm. <laughs> health was really important. Art was only trivial and unessential. He drank a lot. He philandered with the girls' students, and he took no orders and abided by no rules or schedules of the place. He did what he wanted to do, when and how he wanted to do it. His work was so excellent that I put up with it for two summers, but at the end of the 1943 summer, he got so peremptory in his advice as to how I should run all my business that when he left the place, hardly speaking to me because I had not followed his advice, I felt he had lived out his usefulness and never invited him back again. <laughs> P.S., I just want to add to this, this was written by Sean, uh, I can date it pretty carefully, actually, because of, or closely, because of him saying he never invited him back again. Well, actually, four years later, he invited him back uh, in 1947, 48, 49, 50, 51. <laughs> so they obviously mended their fences, and, uh, and he, came, he became, again, a very treasured member of the Pillow faculty. And this is all part of the Say It As It Is volumes that right. we're going to be sharing with you today. Uh, one of the things that we're going to be showing you right now, in fact, is a, a film from 1942. This film, by the way, is courtesy of Mary Bowen, um, who, who has had a copy of it and, um, and also distributes it. Um, interestingly, too, in this group, the, the girl in the first row in the dark-colored leotard at the far right there um, just visited us a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we didn't know who any of the people in this film were, but that is one Mary Blim, and or she, Mary Blim was her maiden name, she's now Mary Hoke. She was a student in 1942, and she had not visited Jacob's Pillow since that summer. So 68 years later, she just uh, came through our doorway uh, a couple of weeks ago, and when she mentioned Pilates, and we were talking about the fact that we were gonna do this today, and I pulled out uh, the photograph of this session, uh, she looked at the, uh, in, the, in the still photograph, she's right in front and said, well, that's me. So uh, that, was, that was quite a thrill for us. Perhaps you can just tell us a little bit about some of the exercises and perhaps if they've changed, if they've altered, that kind of thing. What Pilates did is he looked at how animals and people moved and, and, and looked at how movement is supposed to work from the core because that's how animals move and that's how we're supposed to move. And then he developed the exercises to reproduce that. When you do a Pilates uh, full workout, you go through the developmental sequence, which is you start on your back, you go to your stomach, 
You go to your side, you sit up, you kneel, you pike, and you stand. And that's sort of how babies, and we all, we all learn that way. And if you don't keep doing that, you, you know, you ever heard the term, you, if you don't use it, you'll lose it? Well, we start to lose it. That's why you lose your balance. You lose a lot of other things as we get older, because we're not doing that movements the way we should be throughout a lifetime. And that was his philosophy, that if you, you, know, if you just did the mat, you know, and you, don't, and you don't have any problems about doing the mat because I don't have the equipment, I don't have the space, I don't have... There's always the time issue with exercise, but he ran into the same issues. So basically, the mat was what you would be able to do no matter where you were. I want to also introduce right now Anne Hutchison Guest. She is here with us today from 1941. She was a student here in 1942. She studied with Pilates. She was on the faculty here at Jacob's Pillow in the 1950s, and she is an internationally recognized expert on dance notation. Welcome, Anne. Thank you. Well, we had the mat work every morning in 1942, my second season at the Pillow. I was here in 41 as well. But uh, my experience with Joe, of course, was 42. And um, we never got further than the mat. But later on, when he had his own house, he established himself uh, at the beginning of George Carter Road, you continue on Route 20 a little bit, up that road to the left was where he established himself, and in the barn, he put the various uh, apparatus that he was using, but I'll mention that again later. So, memories. First of all, of course, he, in my day, was really rather robust and almost squatty and always holding his chest up, very um, <clears throat> had to show. He and Ted Shawn used to have um, competition. <laughs> they all pull themselves in to have a photograph taken to send people at Christmas. <laughs> and Ted Shawn and Margaret Morris did a similar thing. She, of course, doing her Margaret Morris movement. But I must talk about uh, Joe. So Joe was rather stern. Uh, not always so pleasant. Up the leg! <laughs> <laughs> when I say up the leg, I mean what the leg. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. <laughs> well, I did go to his studio in New York. And he wasn't very patient with people who were weak and not very good. And there was a barrel-like contraption that I had to bend over, and my back muscles were weak, and I wasn't managing. And he got so annoyed. But Clara came over, and she assisted me. And she was much sweeter, much nicer. The, um, Next time that I saw Joe, and this was some time later, in fact, it must have been after 1962, because I went with my husband, Ivor Guest, to visit his house near the pillow and um, to chat and see just, uh, how things were. And he very kindly showed me where the key was to the barn, so any time I could go and do some exercising. But the um, amusing incident at that visit was because talking about fitness and how important and how so many important people in the world just weren't taking care of themselves, he suddenly with his legs completely straight, did a jackknife down, beat the ground with the back of his fist, and said, can the Pope do that? <laughs> my, my other involvement was when his book 
um, what was the Return title? To Return to Life. Return to Life came out. I and a student notated it all, um, wrote it in Lava notation. So that never got published, but exists in New York at the Dance Notation Bureau. I'm sure things have changed so much over the years. Many of the details may be different now, but at least this was a beginning to have it accessible for those who could read Lava Notation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, this is actually a very telling anecdote because it is uh, Gertrude Hallenbeck, um, who was a, a student here in 1941 and 42 and, uh, and performed here later than that. She is uh, no longer with us. Uh, but several years ago, I guess it was about 10 years ago, uh, we did a little, uh, Gertrude did an oral history with us and talked about a number of memories of being here uh, at the pillow, including this memory of Joseph Pilates. Now, one of the things I want to say about this also is that, in a way, this particular memory is uh, is one of the one of the uh, stimulants for a lot of what we're doing here today, because uh, there was a researcher who came here during the year, Angela Anthony, who's with us today, um, who looked at some of the resources that we had about uh, Pilates, and one of the things that she found of most interest was this little uh, video vignette with Gertrude Hallenbeck, because it was a first-person story. It was somebody telling, someone who knew Joe Pilates telling a story from a first-person standpoint. And it just made me realize that while there are still people with us who knew Pilates firsthand, that it would be great to gather some of them together and gather some memories together uh, so that we would have those for future generations to, uh, to remember him by. And Joe Pilates was here mm -hmm. the year that Sean was here. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was the year that the ballet theater was here because I, we were doing Pas de Deux class in the studio. And Sammy Steen was one of the, the com mm -hmm. company members. And he was my partner. And he lifted me up in an arabesque and put me down the wrong beat. And I came down and drove my leg back up into my groin. And I couldn't even move. And so I was limping into the uh, luncheons, the cottage over there for lunch. And Joe Pilates was outside. And he, and he was standing there. And he said, Never hurt yourself, he said. Dancers never hurt themselves unless they're dancing incorrectly. And I said, I wasn't dancing incorrectly. My partner was out of time, and I hurt my leg. And I showed it to him. He said, no lunch for you. He picked me up in his arms and threw me on the ground outside of the, the dining cabin. And he said, I bring you lunch. You stay there. So I'm with my foot up in the air like this. And, the thing, and I had my lunch, and everybody's going by and saying, what's the matter with you? I said, Joe Pilates told me to stay here until after I, after I finished lunch. I was there exactly an hour. He said, I bring back the dishes. He said, you get up, you go dance. I was fine. He knew exactly what to do. Another letter I have is from Andy Kochari. Uh, Andy was here on the GI Bill in the late 40s, as were others. And um, he he writes that Joe Pilates was on the Jacobs Pillow staff during the summer of 1948. His class was the first session each morning, and his lessons were of general exercise with emphasis on flexibility. He was very friendly to everyone and spent time with us during meals and evenings. His classes in New York City were popular with the ballet dancers like Alexandra Danilova and Frederick Franklin. He, is, he experimented with various devices to promote strength and flexibility. He had some of those contraptions with him at Jacob's Pillow. He stressed that the spinal column should be straight, no natural curves. I remember having many discussions about that issue, which I totally disagreed with him. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm McCormick was um, st a student here in 1947. Uh, he has participated recently in a pillow talk uh, because he co-wrote with Nancy Reynolds a book called No Fixed Points, uh, which came out a couple of years ago. Um, and so he wrote, as you might expect from a writer, he wrote us a three-page letter all about his memories. Um, I'm just going to read you a short uh, paragraph from it. He says, I did work with Joe Pilates that summer at the Pillow, but I had been studying dance 
for only about six months and was very shy about getting to know the more experienced people and faculty, too much in awe of them. So I have few memories of Pilates outside the classroom where we, of course, worked on mats rather than his clever constructions. I remember being told that he had designed a fitness program for Hitler, and that increased my reticence. In 1947, his appearance was quite different from the photographs you've used in your current brochure. White-haired and though trim and taut muscularly, his midsection had broadened in every direction, leaving spindly little legs and not much neck. He reminded me of Lewis Carroll's Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> The work was challenging at first, and he was very brusquely insistent that it be done accurately. We'll always remember the ease with which Melissa Hayden executed the most difficult moves perfectly from the very first day. And um, unfortunately, what Pilates had to offer was not utilized by other members of the teaching staff that summer. They made no references to the postural support his exercises were designed to instill. Making that connection would have been so important for many of us, including myself and Melissa. Pilates' work, thoughtfully presented in relation to dance training, is the best possible adjunct experience. And I have a contribution that was sent to us by Shari Underwood. You may know her as Shari Traver. Uh, she wrote quite a wonderful uh, letter. It's actually part of a, a larger manuscript that she has, and she also sent along many particular uh, written descriptions of each of the exercises with the small drawings next to them. But here's her uh, recollection. Monday morning, I was up like a shot. With a gulp, I pulled on my black, mercerized cotton leotard and buttoned it at the shoulder while wiggling into my sandals. Grabbing a sweater, I bolted down the hill with the other students, oatmeal, toast, coffee, or cocoa for breakfast. Then I headed for the studio. Peering cautiously into the room at first, I saw a splash of sunlight on the floor and went for the warmth. Good morgen, said a voice with a strong accent. I wheeled around, having seen no one, then spotted a man in white shorts and shirt standing on his head in the corner. <laughs> oh, good morning, I twisted upside down to smile at him. This amused the man. Laughing, he hopped down from his headstand with a little bounce and strolled over to me. Strength worthy of note, solid strength quieted, but, but a hair from expulsion dwelled in this short, rugged, but nimble man. No, no, you stay. Always start the day 15 minutes on the head. I am Joseph Pilates, you new girl. He gripped my hand with a quick, numbing grasp. Turn round, round, he ordered, firmly pushing on my shoulder. I hesitated. Who is Joseph Pilates? Ah, his hands clapped smartly together. The back is no good. Pilates gave a hearty laugh and with a couple hard clasps on my arm promised, we fix you, we fix you. Others were entering the studio with towels or small rugs. Those without quickly seized the mats along the wall, pulled them into the center of a studio and sat on them with proprietary air. I found a bare space on the floor and prayed those aids did not imply acrobatics. Exactly at 8 a.m., with the now familiar smack of his hands, Pilates set off an hour of arduous body alignment which had my adrenals pumping steadily. As he shouted out his commands, everyone instantly flung themselves into energetic contortions. Within minutes, we were all sweating, breathing profusely, profoundly, while stretching to uh, a new degree as he shouted, hold it. In no time, I dearly coveted the mats or even a scrap of worn toweling. Every exercise seemed to grind this joint or that into the floor as we shifted on the stomach all to on the back. It was a relief to have a few exercises standing up. One order sounded as if he had just told us to hug a tree. I bit my lip not to laugh, only to understand that was indeed what he ordered. With arms wrapped around an imaginary tree, we were to squeeze hard. I looked at the others who had feet astride, knees bent, and arms encircling before them, trembling with tension. Veins stood out on foreheads. Seeing my bewilderment, Pilates strode over to me, clapping a heavy hand over my left breast and jiggling it up and down. He roared, 
you want sloppy pectorals? You squeeze. <laughs> he, pulled, he pulled both arms into a circle to get me started and went on to another student while I thought I would die of mortification. <laughs> Nobody laughed or paid the slightest attention. As class went on, I was often a beat behind the other dancers who knew Pilates exercises. Slowly, I began to realize that here, it was allowed to make mistakes. Corrections might be quick and clear, but there was no malice or shame in them. The concentration was on learning, and I suddenly felt free to learn, to think my body through the exercise itself. So next, I joined making strange faces to stretch facial, facial muscles, then tried to balance on my hips. Round the clock was the last exercise. From a complete body flexion to a complete body extension, without head, feet, or arms touching the floor, the student performs one set at every point on his 12-numbered clock, then reverses. Flex, two, three, release, two, three, knees to forehead, 24 dimes, 12, you new girl. Finally, a flat-out collapse on the floor. On the floor, we rested. Pilates stopped me one more time on my way out of the studio, placing both hands on my hip bones. He tipped my pelvis under so his thumbs pressed into my flesh in a most ticklish way. Distress kept me from yelping, this way, only this way you. He frowned and then smiled. How I dared to come. So that is from Shari, uh, <laughs> Shari Underwood, who you may know as Shari Traver. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, and come back, please. Thank you.